I've really been seeking the Lord um, on what he wants to share. And I really know he's got an incredible word of encouragement to everyone tonight that's here and listening online. And it's going to be amazing because it's his word. So let me get started with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for this time. God, we're living in right now. For such a time as this, God, you've called us here, your people, to accomplish your will. So, Father, tonight I pray that. I pray that your will would be done, Lord, according to your word, according to you what accomplished tonight through it. Lord, I pray and I ask, Father, that you would open up the hearts of those that are here, Lord, and listening, Lord, even online. I just pray for that right now. God, I pray that you would give them ears to hear, Lord, and not ears physically just here, but the ears of their heart. God, I pray that you'd open that up, Lord, so they can receive what you have for them this evening. I pray and ask this, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Glory. Yes. If you want to know where I got that from, it's in Psalms. Check it out. So tonight, um, I'm going to start in Matthew 24, if you want to turn there. Matthew 24, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 14, but that's not going to be the entire part of the message, but that's where we're going to begin. So I'll give you a chance to turn there. And in Matthew 24, what we're going to be reading in here is where Jesus is going to answer a question that his disciples asked him. This was a couple of days before um, the Passover that this took place. So chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. That is actually still true to this day. Those stones that he mentioned from the temple are literally still sitting down at the bottom of the wailing wall. You can actually see them there. I know if you guys have been there, they're there. It actually happened. So if you're wondering, if you've ever been, if you're you know, listening and you've always you know, had doubt or wondering, you know, is God really real? Is, is uh, you know, any evidence? Here's an actual physical piece of evidence you can actually see with your eyes. And it's over in Israel today, this temple. And it was a big temple. And you can see that from the size of these stones. They were massive. And it was the Romans that actually threw those down. They actually took every single stone, every single one, just like he promised, and threw them over there. So I just wanted to share that out there. If there was any thought of why, you know, you, you can prove to me that God is real. Well, there's one little small one. I mean, it's myriads of them, but, that, but this one's a really good one. I like it because it's right there. <laughs> you can totally see it. So verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And I love it. Jesus actually answered him, and he told him. And it's really good. Jesus answered this, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. We see that today. We've heard that. In years past, since I've been a little kid, I've heard several different times, even on the even on the news, on the TV screen, people claiming to be Jesus. Oh, I'm the, I'm, I'm the Lord. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. Jesus was talking about this. So again, you want some more proof? 
this really happened? I'm sure you can probably go on YouTube now and actually type this stuff in. People that claim to be Jesus and how did their lives end up and were they really him? <laughs> but you could probably find that on YouTube. Another great example. And will deceive many, he said. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Here's another one. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're literally seeing one right now taking place over in Ukraine with Russia. That's a real war. There's another one. But if that's not enough, you can just kind of take a quick glance at history and look back. There's been a lot. He says, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Again, look through history and you can see all of that, even to this very moment. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And in Luke chapter uh, 21, he actually actually adds pestilences to that as well. And we all know that we just went through one that was worldwide, it was COVID. That was a pestilence. And it affected the whole world in a unique way that has never happened as far as I know, and I don't know all things, but from what I know, that has never happened ever in the history of humanity. And the world, I mean, we're talking the globe, literally, unilaterally decided, we're going to just shut it down. And people capitulated. Even myself for two weeks, to which I had to, I had to uh, check that with the Lord at that time. And, and let me just share with you, uh, when I sought the Lord for that, he kind of checked me on that. He goes, I never told you to stop worshiping. I never did. That was those that were in power that did that. I never called you to that. So I repented and said, okay, Lord, never again. I'm going to fellowship. Just like the disciples said when they were commanded, do not preach in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and they rightfully answered, Judge for yourselves whether we should obey man or God. Very, very respectful, even to their leadership of the day. And their leadership was also wrong for that commandment. But they obeyed the Lord. So Jesus warned of these things that were happening. And we have literally lived through one of those, straight up. More evidence for anyone that might be questioning, is God really real? It's adding up. And it'll continue to add up. It's really, really amazing. God, God's great. He's gracious. He even uses these things, these negative things, to draw people unto himself. Because he tells them, he tells us these things before they happen. And that can only be done by God. He's the only one that can know the end from the beginning and proclaims it. I believe there's a scripture that says that. I think it's in Isaiah somewhere. Am I right, bro? God is really good. So he even uses this right here, and he tells us, again, he says, such things must happen, but the end is still yet to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these, he says, are the beginning of birth pains. The birth pains that he's talking about is what is actually yet to come, because Jesus is actually going to be the one that's coming. He's coming back. And like, I know you've probably heard this before, so you'll hear it again for the second time, right? Or the third or fourth or how many? But like a woman that's pregnant, that's giving birth, it doesn't feel good to go through that particular, you know, stage. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, probably some crying. Probably some complaining, like my brother was sharing earlier. I can, I can relate. Probably some complaining. But at the end of it, it's glorious because now there's this new birth. And all that 
suffering that was done before the birth is kind of basically forgotten because this is just wonderful. And that's that is what Jesus is talking about here. He wants to put this in perspective. These birth pangs that we're seeing like this, yeah, they are difficult. Um, I'm sure there, there may have been some of us that probably was complaining a bit or two during COVID <laughs> over lots of different little things. Um, I know I was challenged. Um, I was not perfect in not complaining. Um, so I appreciate you being honest about that, Jared. <laughs> that, was, that was spot on. But God was quick to help me out with that, to bring me back into perspective. And he actually used this scripture to do just that right here in Matthew 24. He just simply reminded me, because I told you about this stuff. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, you did. He's like, it should be a surprise to you. Oh, you're, well, it isn't. Exactly. Recalibration. And this is what Jesus, I really believe he intended to do for us today. Us today, living here right now. He did this, not just for the disciples, even though they were asking. They've gone. They're, they've passed away since then. He's letting us know right now today. So we, when we see these things happen, we too don't have to be alarmed, like he says. We don't have to get freaked out. We don't have to get worried. Because who's really in control here? The Lord is in control. Amen. That is right. Our, our government leadership throughout the world, yes, there is an amount of control they have, absolutely, but the Lord is the one that controls all of that. Amen. There's a scripture, actually, that says that, too. Jesus said that. He says, all authority has been given unto me personally. So everything's got to go through his stamp of approval. Praise God for that. Amen. He is in control. Yes, his word is an anchor for our soul. It's so good. Hallelujah. Man, I just, I got to give him glory. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's so good. I, I just, I just got to say, it's so good to hear the children of God give him the glory that is due his name. Because he wants it. He wants you to give it and it blesses him when you do it. So give it. Amen. Hallelujah. So he says, then in verse 9, then you will be handed over to be persecuted. Again, more difficult words. This doesn't sound very nice. That we're going to be persecuted and put to death. Well, that really doesn't sound very good. And you will be hated. Well, here's another one. That doesn't sound good either. By all nations because of me. At that time, and here is the crux of the message the Lord really wants us to hear tonight. It says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. The faith that he's talking about is him right here, the word, his word. If you'll catch a little bit earlier when I said when COVID was going on, I kind of was like, whoa, you know. And he's like, remember, I told you these things. You see, this temptation I even know this. I've read, I've read that a hundred times, but it was the Lord that had to remind me and recalibrate me, bring me back to solid ground. These things are going to happen. Don't turn away from the faith. Faith in what? Faith in him. Faith in his word, which is why he reminded me. Amen. He reminded me. I told you this would happen. Now, not specifically. You can't find COVID. You know, you know get what I'm saying, but but in general, yes, that's a pestilence. It really, really was. That's, you can take a look at it for what it means. That's what he's talking about. So at that time, which is to, speaking of today, these last days, many will turn away. Now, this really captures my heart. Many. He's talking about a lot of people, not just a few. He uses the word many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. I've seen some of that happen during COVID just because, oh, I took the shot or I didn't take the shot or I'm staying home and, or I'm not staying home and you know, you're too close to me. You're within six feet. You know, so I literally saw this happening. I, I watched it unfold. And of course, you know, if you weren't seeing that, you could at least turn on the TV and see it. So <laughs> I mean, it was happening all over. Jesus, again, warned us these things are going to happen. 
And he says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. The false prophets are those that claim to be speaking the word of God. And I really appreciate Calvary Church. I appreciate this body because we read straight from the word, scripture by scripture, line by line. It's his truth is what we need to hear. And there are many people out there just like the enemy of our soul did. I'm going to tell you about 60%, maybe 70%, maybe even 95% of the word. I'm going to teach you that much, but I'm going to throw in this little 5% over here that's untrue. And we see this in false religions. There's enough truth out there. I mean, you can you can actually even get them. Like um, one, of, one of the Bibles you can get um, from the Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, there's a lot of scripture in there that's pretty much word for word that I read in my own, my own Bible. I mean, wow. But there's enough untruth in there to be, la- to be labeled or considered, probably be better to say, as a false prophet. Because a prophet, if you go back into the Old Testament, there's a very specific, very specific um, set of parameters that will qualify you as a real prophet of God. And it's really simple. Basically, you have to be 100% right every time. And Jesus was that 100% prophet every time. Still happening today, even, even in what we're reading here. So many false prophets, he said, are going to go out and they're going to deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, and this is the big heart of what I know God really wants us to know tonight. This is because of the increase of wickedness, and we also saw that during COVID, just lawlessness was abounding. Lawlessness. Wickedness. And because we saw that, I mean, I, will, I can admit, I was watching it, and my heart was just broken. It was grieved. It was, I was even offended to see that kind of dis- disregard for, you know, good authority figures. I mean, my, my heart was just broken over that to the point to where this was a temptation for me. And Jesus said the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And I really appreciate this part right here. Um, the love that we've that's really been taught, you know, Scott brought um, actually the, the word uh, when, when he was up here a couple weeks ago, and he was going through the scriptures, and I was like, oh, okay, Lord, um, he's basically preaching the message that you wanted me to speak, right? I was like, well, then I don't have to do anything, right? <laughs> but he did, he, and it was, it was amazing because I remember at the time, I just got to testify, there was so many of these scriptures that I it was just getting downloaded that I was like, oh, this all this is all part of it. All the scriptures that Scott read, I was literally had most of those written down. Like, oh, is this what you want me to share? And the Lord's like, yeah, I want the people to know that, but you don't have enough time. <laughs> so he provided Scott. It was just amazing. I'm, seriously, he provided Scott without me even knowing. He actually preached the other half of what I thought I was going to share about the love of God. The love of God, which is agape. And I really love how you brought that into play because that's what the Lord really wanted to get across was the agape love, which only he has. We don't have that in and of our own selves independently of God. And that was seen when Jesus was asking Peter, which he did a great job. I was so glad you brought Peter, do you love me? He was asking for agape love from Peter. And it's not that Jesus didn't know that Peter was not capable of that. He wanted Peter to be get, he wanted Peter to basically to be honest with him. I want you to give me what you got. But what I really want is agape. And Peter finally capitulated. Lord, you know I phileo. I, I love you like, you know, a, a close friend, you know, and but agape, uh, he knew, Peter knew I'm I'm just I'm just not quite there. I'm just not there. But this word right here, this is, this is amazing. This is why I, brought, I wanted to remind us of that scripture that Scott was sharing about the agape and how, how Peter was um, you know, talking to Jesus about it. 
This word that he uses right here in the love of many or most in some translations will grow cold. That word right there is not phileo. It's agape. That agape is the love of God in an individual. And that can grow cold. And it's it just blows me away. I'm like, well, how is that possible, Lord? You're God. I mean, how can you grow cold? It's not that God grows cold, but in the individual's heart, God is replaced with all of these other things, all of the wickedness, you know, particularly the wickedness. Well, one of the things that Jesus uh, mentioned about the last days, he said they're going to be like the days of Noah, and the hearts of people will be filled with wickedness. And we get that from, I mean, you just, you can just turn on the TV and just innocently watch the news and just, boop, it's right there. And that stuff you see with your eyes can go into your heart really quick. Like I, like I was confessing to you, I saw all this, you know, wickedness that was happening in our capital, you know, or our big city, not capital, our big city in uh, Portland it was very disheartening to me. Again, like I confess to you, I was tempted to have that love that I have for people, even the people that were doing these wicked things, to grow cold. So I share that with you to let you know that this is real. Jesus, again, is, is, is God real? Is, is Jesus real? Yeah. Let me testify to you personally. Absolutely. He is. Because that was even happening in my heart, tempting for my love that Christ has for me, for the people, for people to grow cold. So I'm like, whoa. So the Lord is aware that of this is going on. And in fact, um, it's going to increase. We're told it's going to increase, Le much like childbirth, like he explains here. You know, th those pains intensify as you get closer to that day or the moment where you give birth. So they're going to intensify as we get closer. Uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to tell you what they are because I have no idea what those are going to come in fashion of. But nonetheless, we're going to see in general, we're going to see wickedness abound. And so Jesus gives us this warning that this is going to happen. And then he says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's a good word. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, the gospel has not yet gone to every, all, every nation on, the, on this planet yet. It's getting closer, really close, but we're not quite there yet. So Jesus wants us to be aware, us, that we're going to be going through these times. These are the last days. So how are we going to not be this one, that our, our love will grow cold. How, how am I going to protect against that? That's like, whoa, that's like huge. How, how can I do this? Well, good news, we're going to find out tonight. So I want you guys to turn. Um, I'm going to take a quick quick pit stop before we go to um, First John, where I'm going to go next. But in I'm going to stop over here really quick in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So it would be chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus shared this with the disciples and everything, and then the Apostle Paul came along. So the Apostle Paul wasn't, you know, one of the original 12 disciples. But yet, here's Paul. He comes along, and he seems to be saying the same exact thing what Jesus said here. So I don't think Jesus, you know, was right there with Paul at that, or, or, or should I say Paul wasn't there with Jesus when he was saying all these things. But yet, he says here in 1 Timothy um, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So even Paul, by the Spirit of God, revealed to him, yeah, man, this is going to happen. So again, I, I go, wow, that's a big deal. How, how am I going to miss this? 
Well, we're going to find out, like I said. We're going to find out here in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read this. We're going to read this book in a little bit of chapter 5. If you guys want to turn there. So this is really good. First John chapter 4 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I wonder where John got that from. <laughs> yeah, we just read. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen. This is part of the answer to that question, how am I going to not be one that's going to grow cold? Jesus said this is literally going to happen to people. He said that is going to happen. Is Jesus 100% right? He's 100% right. So if he's 100% right, how am I not going to be one of those? Because I don't want to be one of those. <laughs> I want to be one of those that are going to stand firm to the end. Jesus, you're going to have to help me out with that. Right here is one of those truths that you need to know tonight. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Because the kingdoms of this world have not yet become the kingdoms of our God. Not yet. They could if he wanted to, but that's not his plan. His game plan's a, you know, a little bit different. In fact, you could read, if you want to read later on in Revelation, we just went through all that anyway. If you haven't, you can read it again. It's always fun. He does have a plan, and the kingdoms of this world will one day become the kingdoms of our God. He actually says that. Jesus says that himself. <laughs> They're going to be his kingdoms. He is going to be the one ruling with an iron scepter. Yeah, yeah, that's our king of kings and lord of lords. He's, he's going to come back. It's awesome. Yes, Jesus will be coming. But until that moment, we're still here in this time, and he is in us. He's in you. This is our blessed hope. Jesus Christ living in us. This is it. It says, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of the truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is how you're going to know those false prophets that he was warning us about. You're going to know because of Jesus Christ who lives in you. Because he's the truth. He's going to bear witness of who he is in you. So verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Here's that agape again. And again, I would throw back to Scott. Great job on reading, you know, put your name in front of uh, what love really means and see if you measure up. <laughs> yeah, we don't measure up. Amen. But he does. You see, Jesus is the one. He's the one that loves. See, that agape, that's in you. That's him. He's the one that gives you that agape love. You got to just pull that in, hold that in close. Jesus said to some of his um, uh, churches, one of his churches, he says, return to your first love. I think we even sang that in one of the songs tonight. He says, come back to your first love. You see, he, his love is still agape. Even at the moment when he said that, 
And they, they left his first thing. Man, you, you left me. I, I still love you. My love for you has not changed. That's what he was saying. Come on back. There it is right there. Jesus wants us to remain in him. So this agape love is from God. This is how God showed love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now, this is amazing to me. Don't let, I just want to let this miss, miss you guys, that we may live through him. The life that he gives us is lived through Christ. It's him. Paul said it. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. It's the love of God. Another throwback to Scott is the love of God that compels me. It's what compels me to love my neighbor as myself, my enemies as the Lord would love them. God's love in me is what compels me to do that. I can't conjure that up on my own, which is great because it doesn't depend on me anymore. It really doesn't because it's not something that I can conjure up on my own. I can't will it to happen. I can't you know, hunker down and read enough or do this or do that. I can't make that happen because Christ has already done it for me. He is love. I just got to accept it. It's that simple. This is how we overcome. It's amazing. So I want to read on because John explains this even better than I could ever do it. Because, well, that's God talking through John here. It's beautiful. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is is made complete in us. That is basically saying, this is how you're going to know because Jesus is going to love through you. It's that simple. It's easy. You just admit, God, I I, I can't love that person. I I, I, I want to. I really want to. I want to. I will to try to do it. I want to try to do it. But there's just something in me that's just like, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> you got to help me out. And he's like, absolutely. I will give you the love you're going to need to love this person. It's the love of God that compels us to do this. And John is talking about that right there. It's his love that's in us. It's how you're going to know. It says, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. It's that simple. If you don't believe or if you're questioning him, that's simply how you do it. You just take him at his word. You just believe that he really came. And there's enough evidence, again, there's enough evidence for Jesus. You can search it. We got YouTube now, right? I had to mention that. Go on YouTube. They'll show you. It's great. Jesus, you just got to believe that he was. And there he is. He's ready. His arms are open wide. He's just waiting for us to accept him. That's all he wanted. He was asked a question one time. He goes, Lord, you know, what must we do to do the works of God? And you, you're thinking it's going to be, well, it's going to be this big, huge thing. Like, I got to read like 10 scriptures or I got to, I got to go do this for God over here. Or I got to, I, I got to do this. And then Jesus just kind of just comes out. He just goes, believe in the one who you sent. You just got to believe. And you're going to do those works. Do you see? It's that simple childlike faith in what Jesus has said. That is what's going to get you through. It's not, it's not going to be us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's not going to be us. It's going to be him. He's going to get us through. So when we see these 
evil things that are happening in the world and all of this stuff. Jesus is the one that's going to make our hearts stand firm. And how do we stand firm? Like he says, those who stand firm at the end, they'll be saved. How are we going to stand, stand firm? Well, we're not strong enough to do that. I can't do that in and of myself. We stand firm in what Christ has accomplished for us. That's how we stand firm. We stand firm in Jesus' ability to accomplish that in our hearts. That's how we're going to do it. It's the only way. He is the only way. Jesus said it because I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is. This is that same life that John's talking about here. And we know and rely on the love that God has for us. It's exactly what I was talking about right there in verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. You see, the confidence is not in your own abilities. It's not in what you can bring to the table. It's in what he has already brought. Jesus Christ has brought it. He has brought it. We just need to receive that and accept it and continue in it. It's really that simple. This is, this is the hope that we have. It's in Christ. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love, again, because he first loved us. This is how we get that perfect love in our hearts, which casts out the fear of judgment. We, there's a wonderful song that we sing. Everybody knows it, Amazing Grace. That guy got it. He got what that verse was talking about right there. It was grace that taught me how to fear. Oh, yeah, because the beginning of wisdom, that wisdom that he was talking about earlier that I have, yeah, that, that fear, that, that's wisdom. You need to fear the King of kings and the Lord of lords because you're going to be judged one day. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of a scary thought because I'm guilty. Well, good news for you. You don't have to fear me that way no more because it's by that same grace in that song that says, that set me free. It's the love of God. Beautiful song. Yeah, glory. What, what else can you say to that? Amen. Glory to him. He did that. I love that. That guy who made that, it just, yeah, his story is amazing. He really got it. He understood. It was grace that taught me how to fear. And by grace, my fears are relieved because Jesus is the one that paid my punishment. That fear of punishment is now gone because Jesus paid that for me. And I received that. So we love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, well, he's a liar. He's not telling the truth. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. God's commandments are easy when we do it his way. When we lay out the Ten Commandments, they're impossible. We look at them, and we're guilty of them. We, we, we fall short. But Jesus actually summed all the Ten Commandments up into two. He says, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do the second one until you do the first, and you can't do the first until you receive what Jesus has already done for you, and it's already done. He died for the sins of the entire world, for all humanity, all humanity, good, bad, indifferent, all of us. He died for humanity. His, his sacrifice was sufficient, and all we have to do is receive that. Jesus said, he who 
loves much has been forgiven much. So when we really, truly, when we really, truly get a hold of that, and I believe that, you know, probably everybody here has, and if you, but if you haven't, it's okay because you can right now. You can totally accept what Jesus, because it's already sufficient. He did it. It's already been paid. You just got to receive that. See, he already loves you. His love for you is not conditional on your response, which is the beauty of God's love. He's sovereign. I, he chooses to love independently of us. Thank you, Lord. His love is constant. We just need to receive that and, and just believe it. Believe, yeah, believe that he loved you because he literally did. He died on the cross to prove it. His love is sufficient. And when you truly grab a hold of that, which I believe, again, you have, and if you haven't, you can. It's, that, it's literally that simple. You don't have to pray some special prayer. It's great. You can pray. That's great. It's helpful. Yes, absolutely. But simply believing what you've heard tonight. Jesus died for me on that cross. My sins are forgiven. My punishment has been taken because Jesus paid it on the cross. That's why he died on the cross, because that's what we deserved. And it's that same love, that same agape love that he poured out into our hearts by his Holy Spirit so that during these last days, when we are faced with all of this evil and these things that he warns us about that are coming, pestilences and wars and famines, it's all over. I mean, it could literally happen here in America. It almost did during COVID. Our, our, our sister state in California, they were starting to do it. They were starting to attack churches. It was happening. I was like, dude, it's on our doorstep. It's coming. Jesus let me, how am I going to survive that? How am I, how am I going to not be, you know, hateful towards these people when Jesus commands me not to? Well, there's no way in and of myself. Jesus has provided that way for me. I just got to get calibrated. Like I said, you get calibrated on the word of God on what he has. So I want to finish tonight with an encouragement prayer. Again, this is great. This is going to consummate it for you guys tonight. Again, Paul said it. He doesn't put any confidence in the flesh. Don't put any confidence in your willpower or your flesh to be able to survive this end times and and keep your, your love, you know, burning, you know, like agape here. Give that up. It's not going to happen. There's a, a coined phrase. It's kind of funny. Uh, you don't have a prayer. <laughs> but that's okay. There's someone who has a prayer for you. And it's in John chapter 17. This is awesome. Two days after he told them about all the stuff that's going to happen, which we're living through today right now that we just read here in John 17. Two days later, John writes this down. That This is what Jesus This is his prayer. And I'm going to read here in uh, chapter 17, um, verse. I'm going to have to use my phone because it's a little little dark. It's pretty cool, huh? Reading scripture by phone light. It's the first, for me anyway. This is good. It's in chapter 20. I can can read it now. This is so cool. And uh, the heading in my Bible, it's actually says, Jesus' prayer for all believers. So again, my little cute comment, you don't have a prayer? That's okay. Jesus has got one for you. Amen. Listen. Listen up to this prayer. Because this is what's going to get you through here in the last days. This prayer. This is Jesus speaking. My prayer is not for them alone. And he's speaking about the disciples because he just got done praying for the disciples in the um, uh, previous um, scriptures. Right before here, verse 20. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. It says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe This is amazing. Catch this. You see, his blood was sufficient on that cross to die for the sins of the world. There's enough room in the New Jerusalem for every single human being that's ever been born. That's how big the New Jerusalem is. 
And this love that he shows for us, he wants that to be a testimony to live through you guys in these last days so that the world can also come and be part of this same prayer. So he included them right here. That you have sent me, because that's all they got to do is believe that that's what Jesus said. What must I do to do the works of God? What's my, what must I do for this agape love? Believe in the one that he has sent. I have given them the glory that you gave me. That blows me away. There's a scripture that says the Lord doesn't share his glory with no man. Well, what's this he's talking about here? This is very specific. He says, I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. This is amazing. This glory that he wouldn't share is being shared with us in the oneness of Christ because what Christ has, he gives us freely. It's the very thing that the enemy of our soul wanted, and he never got it, and Jesus decided to give it to us. And here it is. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them. Check that out. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. There's also a scripture that said that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. He decided before he even created us, I'm going to die for all of you. I'm going to I'm going to purchase all of you. I'm going to do it before I even make you. Yeah. Do you see our salvation is solid in Christ. It's in him. The agape love that he says will grow cold, it won't if you just keep the main thing, the main thing, Jesus in your heart, in me, like Jesus is praying. See, this prayer he prayed for you and I. Hear this tonight. He is your hope. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Glory. Our hope is in Christ. What he has accomplished, it is finished, he said. It's done. You just got to believe it. You just got to hold on to it. He's going to give you that love. His love never fails. We sing about it. That's also in the Psalms. Go read it again for the first time. He will never fail. Love never fails. Our God is good. If you have any doubts tonight, you can wash those away. Those can be gone. Let them go. Jesus paid that for you. This is it. It's all in him. Glory. Let's close in prayer. Father, in summation tonight of your word, Lord, I just believe right now, if there is anyone that has heard these words that were spoken from you, Jesus, these are your words. Lord, they're yours. And you don't lie. Hallelujah, Lord, you don't lie. God, I pray for each and every person tonight that's heard these words according to your word, according to your promise, God. You will remind them of these things by your spirit. Lord, it is your love that's never going to run dry. It's never going to grow cold. Lord, in you, we have all that we need. God, I pray for each and every person that has heard this. Lord, they will not turn to the left. They will not turn to the right. But God, you'll keep them solid, straight on, Lord, right to you. Lord, you paid the way. God, keep us firm in you, Jesus, you holding on to us. I pray that, Father, for each and every person tonight, God. 
I thank you so much for your word, and I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen.